Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Inclusion Coach. My name's Rebecca, and I am your Inclusion Coach. This week, I'm demystifying white supremacy. Now, that term and this subject can be a really tough one for white people to lean into. But stick with me and see how you feel by the end. As white people, we see the term white supremacy and we reject it. That doesn't apply to me. We think I'm one of the good ones. I'm all for equity. I'm all for treating everybody the same way, giving everybody the same opportunities. But if you were born and raised with white skin in a predominantly white country, you have benefited from white supremacy, as have I. And I'm not saying for a minute that all white people have it easy. As John Amici says, white privilege doesn't mean you haven't worked hard or you don't deserve the success you've had. It doesn't mean your life isn't hard or you've never suffered. It simply means that your skin colour has not been the cause of your hardship or suffering. White supremacy isn't about our attitude. It's about how our systems and structures have been built and solidified over hundreds of years to socialise the idea that white people are superior to people with other colours of skin and that therefore our education, health, career paths, everything in life really should be prioritised. Even though slavery and discrimination on racial grounds are now illegal, it has been drummed into us from an early age. We've been socialised to see white skin as superior. And the sad thing is that this white supremacy ideology has also been socialised into black and brown people who were born and raised in predominantly white countries. In the 1940s, two psychologists conducted some research into how young black girls view their own racial identity. Given a choice to play with black dolls or white dolls, they would choose the white dolls. They would ascribe positive characteristics to those white dolls and negative characteristics to the black ones. But that was the 1940s, you're saying, all things have changed now. No, they haven't. In 2021, Tony Sturdivant carried out similar research and found exactly the same thing. She found that young black girls would mistreat the black doll in a way that they wouldn't with the other dolls. For example, they would put it in a cooking pot and pretend to cook the black doll. And that's just one example of how black and brown children are socialized in the same way as white children from birth to see white skin as superior. Let me give you some examples of how this plays out in the UK. You may have seen in the news recently that black women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth. The bias towards black women means they're seen as having a higher pain threshold. They're seen as being aggressive when they question why they're not getting the care they're entitled to. Black women feel unwelcome and poorly cared for when they are giving birth. Black students are five times more likely to be excluded from school than white students. And more than one third of black students have at least one exclusion from school between years nine and 11, just when they're studying for their GCSEs. And even though they're more likely to engage and participate in their university courses, black students are significantly less likely to get a first or upper second degree. Records from the last decade in the UK show that black people are six times more likely to be stopped and searched, and they report feeling humiliated and treated like animals. White supremacy grants white people power, privilege and protection that we haven't earned. And I have to tell you that when you start looking into this, it can really turn your world upside down. When you start to realise the scale of it, You feel guilt, shame, anger, fear, frustration, defensiveness. It's really uncomfortable. The hardest thing for white people to do is to acknowledge our racism. It's a label that we really fear. 
to acknowledge that, yes, I've grown up in a society that has prioritized people who look like me to the detriment of black and brown people. The hardest thing for a white person to say is, I am racist. Because the more we focus on trying to prove that we aren't racist, the less equipped we are to examine it, to acknowledge it, and to lean into conversations about it. The more work I do in this space, the more I realize that the reluctance of white people to engage in anti-racism conversations is about fear. It's the fear of realizing that we've been complicit in white supremacy our whole lives. It's the fear of thinking that maybe we aren't the fundamentally decent person that we think we are. And it's the fear of what giving up or sharing our power could do for the privileges, protection and safety that our white skin buys us. If you're still with me at this point, thank you. If this has made you think, wow, I need to do something about this, I need to know more, but I don't know where to start. The best advice I can give you is to read this, Me and White Supremacy by Leila F. Saad. I've drawn on this book a lot in the what I've said in this video. It's 28 days of reflection, taking you through all the ways in which white supremacy has shaped your view of the world and of yourself. It will open your eyes. It will make you feel very uncomfortable, but it will get you on the road to recognizing white supremacy when you see it in yourself and when you see it in others. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.